new chapter in the history of our royal family has begun. The birth of a baby boy to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge heralds the beginning of a new era for the British monarchy, but it also marks the continuation of this ancient institution. Throughout history, royal babies have captured the imagination of the world, and this one will be no exception. I've been looking at what lies ahead for our newly born third in line to the throne. Kate Middleton walked down the aisle here at Westminster Abbey two years ago. There was huge speculation about when the young couple would have their first baby. And then the news broke, albeit not in the way they had planned it. Kate, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Kate was in the early stages of pregnancy and hospitalised with severe morning sickness. The story instantly exploded around the world. Future Queen Kate Middleton expecting her first child. Kate Middleton. William and Kate erwarten ein Kind. The reaction to the news was just a taste of things to come. This tiny baby has begun its life as it will continue in the full glare of the media spotlight. Looking at the swarms of cameras around the palace or the hospital or whatever, you might think media interest has increased. In fact, in the scale of the times, royal babies have fascinated every generation in their different ways. Royal children have always lived life in the public eye. They have to be visible from the start. Our present queen has been photographed since birth. And throughout her childhood, family photo calls and public appearances were regular events. I think the awful thought about it for me is that she can never ever do something on the spur of the moment. And your whole life is, is, is regulated. But as I once heard her say, once you accept that kind of life, um, it just becomes your life. But as technology advances, the pressure has become more intense. The people in there, look at them. <laughs> One of the royal family's yeah. favorite photographers has been following their lives for the past 36 years across 120 countries. When you look at the way the media is now and the access people have to pictures, images, you know, the internet, how much difference will that make, do you think, when this baby is born compared to generations past? Well, it'll be the most photographed baby in the world. Every website will want to get the picture up first. Uh, it will be a massive competition. Then it was rewind my film and go back to the office and, and develop the film. Now, really instantly, it'll be uh, going around the world. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's the way it is now. But, um, you know, lasting images, uh, archival pictures, there, there will always be, you know, whatever, however quickly you get it onto your website or onto your newspaper or onto the TV screen, that won't matter. That picture will be in the archive at Windsor Castle forever. Uh, and that's the important thing. Kate and William are seen as the modern face of the royal family. Despite their immense privilege, their life together has been much closer to the experience of normal couples than it was for previous generations of royals. But there is no getting away from the fact that their child's life will be far from ordinary. We all wonder what our children will become when they grow up, but for Kate and William's baby, there is no choice. His destiny is to become our king, sovereign of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the supreme governor of the Church of England, the head of the Commonwealth of 54 nations and the head of state in 16 countries. It's a future that can weigh heavily on young shoulders. Like many royals, Prince William had a break from the pressures of royal duty while he was at school and university. But after his graduation, he had to face the realities of life as heir to the throne. I think there have been many, many years that he's struggled uh, with his destiny, with that ultimate knowledge that he will be the future king of the United Kingdom. But I think ultimately he has accepted it and William's going to be in a very unique position in terms of, of guiding, advising and, and helping his child overcome some of the hurdles that, of course, he himself had to overcome.
The arrival of a royal baby, particularly one in direct line to the throne, has always been an occasion for national celebration, and many of the traditions have remained the same. Then, as now, gun salutes from the Tower of London and Hyde Park, and peals from the bells of Westminster Abbey and St Paul's welcome a royal heir into the world. And the birth of the new arrival is announced with a notice on the gates of Buckingham Palace, as it was at both Prince Charles's birth in 1948 and Prince William's 34 years later. But every new generation of royals also decides to break with some of the conventions of the past. For centuries, royal mothers-to-be had their babies in their bedchambers, but Diana chose to have her baby here at St Mary's Paddington, just a few miles down the road from Buckingham Palace. And so Prince William became the first heir to the throne to be born in a hospital. Less than a year after the fairy tale wedding of Prince Charles to Lady Diana Spencer, watched on television by 750 million people around the world, press and excited members of the public were camped outside St Mary's waiting for the arrival of the couple's first child. And in another break with tradition, Prince Charles had been with his wife throughout the birth. They were very kind and somehow asked him not to make too much noise. But some sleep is badly needed. Prince William was now second in line to the throne. His future role, like that of his son today, was clear. This tiny baby would grow up to be king one day. Did you get much of a glimpse of him? Oh, yes, it did. Oh, we, can't, we can't see anything coming. We're so thrilled. What do you think of him then? Oh, he's right. wonderful. Absolutely <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> Things were very different when his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, was born. She was the daughter of Prince Albert, the Duke of York, second son of King George V. Her uncle Edward, then unmarried and childless, was the direct successor to the throne, and Elizabeth was third in line. Nobody seriously thought she'd become queen one day. And unlike most kings and queens, Princess Elizabeth wasn't born in a royal palace, but here in Bruton Street in Mayfair. The house which was destroyed in the war was a grand, but by no means palatial home in this affluent part of London. During the pregnancy, doctors soon realized that the birth was going to be difficult and transformed one of the rooms in Bruton Street into an operating theater, where Princess Elizabeth was delivered by cesarean section in the early hours of the 21st of April, 1926. And this is the Daily News from the very next day. A daughter for the Duke and Duchess of York. And they talk of the crowds that gathered outside the house. So many people, in fact, that the nanny had to sneak the young Princess Elizabeth in her pram out through the back gates for what she called the baby's daily airing. But the world had to wait a while to get a good look at the new princess. This first photograph of her wasn't released until a month after her birth. The news of the princess's birth was also a welcome distraction from a major crisis that was about to hit the country. A few weeks before, a long, bitter fight between coal miners and mine owners was threatening to escalate into a general strike. The Home Secretary, Sir William Joynson Hicks, was involved in negotiations with the miners when he was distracted by an ancient duty. When a royal baby was born, a member of the government had to be present to witness the birth. It was a tradition that dated back centuries, probably to the time of James II. It was rumoured that he was unable to produce a legitimate male heir and so smuggled a baby into his wife's bedchamber and passed him off as his successor. So Sir William Joynson Hicks was called to Bruton Street the night before one of his most important meetings with the coal owners to attest the birth of Princess Elizabeth. 22 years later, when the princess was expecting her first baby, her father dispensed with the age-old tradition and spared her the indignity of having a stranger in an adjoining room during the birth. Home Secretary, Mr. Shooter Reed, was excused the historic duty of attending at the palace during the period of the birth. 
Elizabeth gave birth to Prince Charles in her bedroom at Buckingham Palace. Her family was dismayed by the noise of the crowds outside and wanted her to move to a room at the back of the palace, but she insisted. I want my baby to be born in my own room, amongst the things I know, she said. And we welcome you to an excited crowd outside the palace. And every now and again, a cheer goes up and the crowd start to chant, we want Philip. We want the king. And we're looking up to Princess Elizabeth's room. They're heavily shuttered and curtained, but our thoughts are there at the moment. So Prince Charles was born to the cheers of the people at the palace gates. They come to celebrate a much needed boost to the morale of a country still reeling from the Second World War. The prince was born just three years after the war had ended, and rationing was still in full force. His mother announced that a food parcel would be sent to every baby who shared his birthday. And a special department of typists had to be created to cope with letters and presents flooding in from around the world to the as yet nameless baby prince. An early visitor to the palace is the Caxton Hall Registrar of Births, Mr. John Stanley Clare. He shares a royal secret, the Christian names of the baby prince. Royal babies' names have always been the subject of much speculation, and in the months leading up to the birth, thousands of people had a flutter on what Kate and William might pick. But how do you go about choosing a name for a future king? Choosing a name for your own child is, is hard enough, but when you've got to choose the name for the heir to the throne, what a task. What is the protocol, though, for a royal baby? The protocol for a royal baby is slightly different to the rest of us. They have to talk about it with the senior royals, so the Queen will usually have to approve the name. That's traditionally what's happened. And also the thing is about the royals, they have more names than you and me. I, I've got two uh, first names. But most royals have about four, possibly five, and that's so they can make a, a good choice of which name to choose when they become king. So, for example, Albert here, he was always Prince Bertie, and when he did come to the throne after his brother abdicated, he chose to use one of his middle names and become George VI to evoke the fact his father was George V, to really give the impression of a continuous line of succession. They've got plenty of names to choose from. Where do you think they might draw their inspiration? Plenty of names for the boy. We've seen George over and over again for royal men throughout history, and George the Fifth, George the Sixth, the Queen's beloved father. So I think we might see George in there. But there are other names here we can think about. There's Henry, the baby's uncle and probably godfather as well. Henry, of course, one of our most popular kingly British names. Albert, the name of the Queen's father. That might be one that they might pick as well, because it's kind of got that modern, old feel to it. William. Well, the father's name is such an archetypal royal name, William the Conqueror, he's one of our most popular kings. I think we might see that as well, but again, not number one. And what about a nod to Kate's family? What kind of names might they look to there? Well, we've got Kate's brother here is James, of course, that's a very traditional name, a very biblical name, and we have had King Jameses. They just haven't been the most successful of British kings, perhaps, and it seems a name with rather poor association. So I think maybe James might be off the scale, certainly for number one. And also Michael is the name of Kate's father, and I think we might see that one in there as well. Once a royal baby has been named, it's soon time for their first official engagement, the christening. The christening service itself is private and usually performed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. It paves the way for the baby's future role as defender of the faith and head of the Church of England. It's a ceremonial occasion, the first of many for this new royal heir. And like so many royal ceremonies, it comes with its own family traditions. One of them is the christening robe, commissioned by Queen Victoria for her firstborn in 1841. It's been worn by every royal baby since then, including Queen Elizabeth, Prince Charles, and Prince William, who needed a little bit of comfort during the customary photo call. But if tradition is what the royal family stands for, the birth of this royal baby coincides with one of the most radical breaks in the history of our monarchy, an end to the law of primogenitor that favours male over female heirs and has determined the succession to the throne for centuries. 
If the royal baby had been a little girl, it would have marked a huge moment in history. For the first time, a princess would have been born who was destined from birth to be queen, whether or not she had a brother later on. But Kate and William have had a little boy, which means we'll have to wait many years yet to see the effect of the new law of succession. The bill to change the law of succession was put before Parliament by Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg. It's, uh, it's I think, a long overdue step to make sure that the rules of succession uh, fit uh, modern times, uh, even though they, of course, reflect centuries-old traditions. Tell me about the timing of it, though, because that was quite extraordinary, wasn't it? I mean, it genuinely was the case that um, the, the, the Commonwealth realms... And here you're talking about the most extraordinary array of countries, from Tuvalu to... You know, St Kitts to Papua New Guinea, Canada, Australia, all of them finally confirmed that they agreed with these changes in the rules of succession. On the day that uh, it, uh, the, the Buckingham Palace confirmed that the Duchess of Cambridge was pregnant. And, uh, you know, it was an extraordinary but very, very happy coincidence. <laughs> After three years of living in a remote corner of Wales, it looks like Kate and William have been drawn back to the excitement of London life and to a place where William spent much of his childhood. Kate and William already have a cottage in the grounds of Kensington Palace that they use as their London base, but behind that scaffolding, a much bigger home is being prepared. It's called Apartment 1A and it won't be ready in time for the birth, but when it's finished, that wing of the palace is going to give them plenty of room for a royal nursery. In the 60s, Apartment 1A became the venue for society parties with guests like Noel Coward, The Beatles and The Rolling Stones when Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden lived there with their two children. It had a pedigree of royal residence before that, but it's probably most famous as the home of Princess Diana and the place where Prince William and Harry grew up. Tell me about the history of Kensington Palace. How important has it been over the centuries? Well, Kensington is very special because it's witnessed almost 400 years of continuous royal occupation. It's very much a living palace as well as a visitor attraction. Uh, it was built by uh, William and Mary towards the end of the 17th century and since then has witnessed some of the most important events in our royal history and particularly when it comes to royal births. And the most famous being Queen Victoria, who was born here in 1819 and and spent most of her childhood at Kensington under the very strict regime of her mother. And most of Victoria's major life events happened at Kensington. It's where she first clapped eyes on Albert. What is it, do you think, that draws so many royals to make this their home? Well, it's quite a nice location, isn't it? But it's also an amazing palace, an amazing space to be. And I think the fact that it does offer um, the privacy um, as well as the public side and the, and the history that you get in these amazing rooms. This royal baby's upbringing at Kensington Palace certainly won't be as strict as the young Victoria's. What kind of parents do you think William and Kate are going to be? I think if you look at their own childhoods and how they were raised, I think it will be very hands-on. Um, Diana, of course, um, w was especially hands-on with William and Harry, but, but so was the Prince of Wales, and he was there as much as his career allowed him to be to do all of those normal things. Um, Catherine's parents, Carol and Michael, um, also very, very hands-on parents as well. So I think they will take leaves out of their own parents' books and, and apply that to their own baby. But they're, they're going to need a support network in place. Now, that may very well be family and friends, but I think it's also going to have to extend to nursery staff and nannies, and it may not be what they would ideally want, but I think there's very little choice about things like that. They're going to have to have an infrastructure in place to support them so that they can continue with their day jobs. Nannies used to have a major role in the upbringing of their royal charges, and would spend more time with them than their parents, who were often away on lengthy official trips around the globe. There was a lovely lady called Arla, who was actually my nanny. And she was taken away from me <laughs> when I was about 10 months old to go and look after a beautiful new princess. And little Elizabeth, here in Arla's arms, grew very fond of her first nanny. Uh, she was an absolute heavenly person. We all adored her. And then they had two lovely Scottish sisters, the MacDonald sisters. And the eldest one was always just known as Bobo. What kind of people were the nannies? What kind of characters? Well, Arla 
was obviously a very strict in the old-fashioned way. But she also got the most wonderful giggles and was immensely loving and, and cuddly to the children, you know. A hugely important element in their lives, honestly. And what about the Queen as a child? What was she like? What was her character like as a young girl? Well, she was always the more serious of the two sisters. Um, Margaret was always the really naughty one. So we were wonderfully happy doing the very simplest things. I mean, we played for hours in the autumn at what was called Catching Happy Days. Well, that involved really running around like lunatics around the garden, catching leaves that fell off the trees. In so far as possible, which it was, they were just ordinary children doing all the ordinary things that children do. The two princesses still lived a life behind palace doors. They were home educated by governesses and didn't get many opportunities to play with ordinary children. A special Buckingham Palace Girl Guide group was set up for them so they wouldn't be too isolated. When Princess Elizabeth had her own children, nannies continued to play a big role. Scenes like this would have been rare. Official duties called and Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip were often absent on long royal tours. They missed several of Prince Charles's early Christmases and birthdays. Here's wishing a very important young gentleman many happy returns of the day on his third birthday. It's unfortunate that mother and father are not here to share it with him, but what a party they'll have when they do get back. When the Queen was at home, she tried to find a compromise between her role as monarch and mother. She changed the time of her weekly audience with Prime Minister Winston Churchill to be with her children at bath time. What was it like for the Queen when she had Prince Charles, she had Princess Anne? What was it like for her as a mother and a monarch? Naturally, as a mother, um, she, she, she loved her children, she wanted to play with them all the rest of it in a sort of normal way. And obviously that was slightly curtailed in moments when she had to do business things. Duty versus pleasure. I mean, having to give up certain things like loving your children and wanting to be with them for the duty of doing what you've got to do as queen. By the time Prince William was born, things had changed. Diana and Charles wanted to give their children as normal a childhood as possible and didn't want to be distant parents. So when they went on their first official tour after having William, they took the 10-month-old baby with them to Australia and New Zealand, much to the delight of the world's press. <laughs> they went to Australia and New Zealand for five weeks. No royal baby had ever accompanied their parents before. And, uh, and I think Diana said, if William doesn't go, I don't go because she was a young girl. She was 20 years of age. This little baby was her firstborn. She didn't want to be five weeks away from him. And we got the arrival in Alice Springs and we got a great photo call in Auckland where William crawled for the first time. But this new relaxed royal family wasn't always met with public approval. Well, Diana got a hard time because the boys were photographed, for example, that time famously at Thorpe Park. But I think both Charles and Diana's thinking was that that was a small price to pay for that bite of, of normal life and excitement and just being able to go and do what their friends did. OK, there'd be pictures, but they were happy pictures of happy times. And was that really such a bad thing? I think it's a small price to pay. It's no doubt that Diana changed the mould of royal upbringing in many ways. But let's not forget that Prince Charles was just as much involved. He, after all, was the parent who had the experience of being a young royal growing up. He wanted them brought up in a softer, more human, less formal way than had been the case um, for himself and Princess Anne. Prince William was also the first heir to the throne to attend a public nursery school, Mrs Miners in Notting Hill, just up the road from Kensington Palace. Prince William came here when he was three. He arrived with his parents on his first day, a small boy taking a big step in life, an intimate family moment, but the world was watching. 
A year later, the press were there again when he started at Weatherby Prep School, around the corner from Mrs Miners. Harry joined him here and Diana famously took part in the mother's race on sports day. <laughs> the challenge for royal parents is to hold on to the innocence of childhood whilst preparing the heir to the throne for the significance of the role that awaits them. Princess Elizabeth's handwritten diary of her father's coronation shortly after her 11th birthday really brings this home. By the time she wrote this, she would have known that in all likelihood, she would one day be at the centre of the very same ceremony. Then came Papa looking very beautiful in a crimson robe and the cap of state. I thought it all very, very wonderful, and I expect the Abbey did too. At the end, the service got rather boring, as it was all prayers. Granny and I were looking to see how many more pages to the end, and we turned one more, and I turned to the word at the bottom of the page, and it said, Finny. We both smiled at each other and turned back to the service. No doubt the new royal heir will quickly learn to shoulder his responsibilities and master the art of public engagements, just like his great-grandmother, grandfather, and father, Prince William, did before him. It's a world away from most children's lives. As Princess Diana once remarked, most parents...